morning. Um, don't look now, but there are five little children here, and they're all absolutely enormously precious. Of course, I'm a little prejudiced on three of them, but I love all of them. Oh, and then we got Mike way over here. I did see a moose on the loose earlier. I'm sorry he doesn't seem to be in the vicinity currently, but maybe he will be before the day is over. We'll have to see. Anyway, um, we're glad you're here. If you would like to turn, please, to hymn 206. We're going to begin our service.
through Jesus Christ, with God our Father. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would remain standing, we're going to have that one more hymn, and that's number 450. <clears throat> it's a beautiful summer morning. And uh, somebody told me there's only a few summer mornings left.
that doesn't move you, check your pulse, you may need to. Okay, um, announcements. Uh, if we have any visitors with us, welcome to the church. If you haven't been given a visitor's card, please raise your hand. We'd love to have a record of your visit. Um, there'll be a card to fill out, put it in the offering plate. There'll be a pen, keep it, put it in your pocket. For us, if you don't have any visitors here with today, those who are here today, pray for visitors. We may have Sunday school. If you weren't here for Sunday school, you missed out on a wonderful message by uh, the book of Habakkuk. Um, that the just live by faith. A communion normally would have been today, but it has been moved out a week to next Sunday at 12. Very hard to mind for communion next Sunday. The public committee, an update. Um, dear faithful folks, continue to pray, press forward, the discovery of God's man. Uh, we need to be in prayer without ceasing for these folks for unity, focus, vision, discernment, and stand. Um, they've received several dozen recent inquiries resumes and work through them all over the speed, continue praying and need more help. Women's Bible study will be Monday morning at 10.30 here at the church. Um, this week will be the last study for the summer, so if you haven't had a chance to uh, attend one of the ladies' photo studies, get here next uh, Monday tomorrow. Uh, ladies will be resuming on September. Uh, prayer meeting, Tuesday at 7 p.m. sharp, which apparently is still TBA. At Linda's house, be there. Last time we could go there, that was something. Uh, make sure you get there on time. If you don't, you get to lead it. Um, if you ever, ever, ever have a chance to come to a prayer meeting, come Tuesday. Um, we need prayer for everyone. 87 Stanley Street. Uh, 87, Stanley. 87 Stanley Street. Okay. If you don't know where that is, there's this thing called Google Maps. You should be able to find it very nicely. Uh, missionary, our missionary of the month is the Genesis, Friends of Israel. Uh, they're traveling and trying to meet folks. However, they are coming up short on their financial support. Um, check. Ministry and they seem friend of Israel at the church. The link in the back of your bulletin. Uh, prayer calendars for August are on the back table. Uh, for Austin. Um, also on the table is the sign up sheet for the booth tent that's going to be at the Italian Fest. The church and Italian Fest is coming up for late. So if you haven't signed up, if you can attend, if all can attend, please do so. Um, today is all possible. Um, we're looking to have three people on each slot for the day. August 13th, week from Monday, 10.30 a.m. is set up for the BBS, and that's at night, 7 p.m. There will be a BBS meeting here at the church. And so if you have any interest or if you're involved with BBS, Here's your eyes are telling you 
find some young children, bring them with you to help find them. And uh, on September 28th, so the future here from the Green uh, Team Resource Center, the Valleys is having their uh, annual fundraising banquet at the Oak Valley Center, Tennessee, at 6 30. And you put the table uh, for eight by It is by, by grace you have been saved. God will show the incomparable the riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 3 Are there any other announcements that? Some of you may have noticed our beloved sister Alice is not with us this morning. Apparently, she had some issues with uh, some medication levels, and they just didn't want to risk uh, something happening here where we just didn't have help. So, be in prayer for our sister Alice that uh, the doctor will attend her and that she be restored to us.
you do too. I think it's special because you're here. And I think it's special because Tim's here. Not only this Tim, but that Tim over there. That Tim over there belongs to me, by the way. And this Tim belongs to me spiritually as well. So um, we to have two, two Tims here. We're excited. Uh, did uh, Michael have a good week over there at Camp Kareth? Yes, he did. Very good. We're excited about that. Yes, Pastor. I want to tell that Tim over there that he and Eli painted the house for me many, many years ago. Oh. The same paint is still on the house. <laughs> <laughs> did you recommend the paint or did they go out and get it? Oh, yeah, that's why. <laughs> if Tim would have painted it, it would have been. The low grade at uh, Walmart somewhere, and it's been off in two years in heavy rain. Uh, glad you're here. Hey, I don't know about you, but I I've taken a little risk with Tim. I don't know him very well. This Tim, my brother Tim, and uh, invited him to, to to play a special music, not knowing for sure what he was going to do. Now I could do that a lot. I thought that was pretty cool. Now, if you played the piano too loud or sang too soft or something like that, but you enjoyed it in general, then please say something to him or some, something to me. Um, I would hope that he'll be here for a while. We'll see how God leads in his life, but uh, um, I enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I also enjoy what we do ordinarily on Sunday morning. When we start with a hymn, especially like we did this morning, those rousing two games, I got to tell you, man, I'm getting, now, Marlon may have an excuse because he doesn't generally stand up on Sunday morning for the song. But by golly, one of these mornings, when he stands up to sing, which might be next Sunday morning, you can be sure he's going to belt it up. Now, I didn't hear Eric singing. And I know I would hear Eric singing if he was singing because he don't sing no good at all. And I would hear him. <laughs> We're in Acts chapter 22. This is a, uh, again, a long series on grace. They're on uh, the book of Acts. And uh, today we're talking about grace. Oh, by the way, uh, I didn't put up a sign out front this week and probably won't for the back most of August because I don't want anything to distract from the moose on the loose signs that Harry did out there. So uh, I don't want to clutter it up too many things to see. I'd rather see them moose on the loose, get the kids in here and their parents. That's going to be rocking good time. <clears throat> in chapter 22 of the book of Acts, uh, I ask that you look at only a couple of verses here that Terry read. And um, I think it's a huge deal. 22, 19, and 20. Because it's about Paul. And it's about Paul's history. And let me tell you why. If you think you have a history, a personal history, where you've done something that's so bad, you're just absolutely convinced God can never, ever love you, much less use you. All you have to do is think about Paul. Because Paul, in these two verses, reminds the crowd that's looking to get rid of him, stone him, kill him, put him in prison, beat him, do whatever, in that, not necessarily in that order, when he says, Lord, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another. All the crowd knows my history. My life is an open book. I have done all these things in public. I went from synagogue to synagogue to a prison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood, stood there, giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Remember the character of Stephen, so gentle, so straightforward in his testimony, so loving in his demeanor, and yet he accepted the, the inevitability of death by stoning, while Paul himself, even by his own admission, stood by approving of it, and in fact, not only approving of it, but guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. How could God love or care for a man like that? If you've never experienced that, you just felt like you were so completely, totally, utterly useless before God. 
that there was no way he could love you, much less use you. You need to think again because scripture says God can always love you and can always use you. You have never ever done anything bad enough to keep his love from you. There is this story. It's supposed to be a true story. I couldn't verify it, but the pastor's probably heard this one before. But uh, this is a story about a young fellow who was uh, uh, impoverished and he um, needed money. He wanted to go to school. He was, a, you know, a teenager. He was saving money to go to like junior college and then to community college and he was going to go to college. But he had a dream that one of these days he would become a medical doctor. And all the odds are stacked against him. At any rate, he was going door to door, and he rang a doorbell, begging for money, begging for food. He came from a family that really didn't exist. He was a street child, somewhere in the United States. And you know, there are a lot more kids that live on the streets than we believe there are. If you listen to the television in Rochester, I mentioned this before, I think, where they had an advertisement that there are 2,000 children who live on the streets in Monroe County. Is that even possible, Linda? Does, does that sound outrageously high? Could that possibly be true? If it's, if it could, even if it was only a half of that, how in the most civilized country in the world, in one of the most high-tech areas of the United States, there be even a hundred homeless children, for heaven's sakes? Well, that's what this young man was. He was homeless. And he was going to door to door, begging for money or food or whatever. Anyway. He rang a doorbell and a lady came to the door. And he lost his nerve to barter for food, so he asked for a drink of water. He was, you know, not dressed very nicely, probably smelled pretty bad, you know, probably had long hair that hadn't been trimmed or cut. The woman looked at him and instantly knew he was hungry. And so instead of bringing him a drink of water, she brought him a glass of milk. And he slowly drank it, and when he finished, he asked, uh, how much do I owe you for a glass of milk? Oh, you don't owe me anything, said the woman. Mother has taught us never to accept pay for kindness. That's a good rule of thumb, isn't it? I think that's a good rule of thumb. Well, the boy said, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really do appreciate it, and he did. When Howard Kelly left the house, that was the boy, he not only felt stronger physically, but his faith in God and good people was renewed. And he was ready to give up on both until this happened with this kind lady. Many years later, the young woman became critically ill. The local doctors were baffled. And they finally sent her to the big city where they called in a specialist to study a rare disease. Doctor. Howard Kelly was called in for consultation. When he heard the name of the town this young woman came from, a strange feeling overcome him, overcame him. Immediately he rose and went down the hall to her hospital room. Dressed in his doctor's gown, he went in to see her and recognized her at once as the woman who gave, her, gave him a glass of milk instead of a glass of water. From that day forward, Dr. Howard Kelly gave her special attention. And after a long struggle, the battle was won. Dr. Kelly requested the business office to pass the final bill to him for his approval. He looked at it and then wrote something on the edge. And the bill was sent to her. When the woman received the bill, she dreaded opening it because she knew it would take the rest of her life and then so to pay for the medical bills. But finally, as she slowly ripped open the envelope and pulled out the invoice, she looked and something caught her attention. On the side of the bill, she read, paid in full with one glass of milk. Is that a cool story? <laughs> That's grace, unmarried favor, getting something you really don't deserve. It's not only legal, it's a legal transaction, but it's a relational transaction. 
That's what grace is between Christ and us, without with God the Father. Let's look at it simply, very quickly this morning, since we uh, crunched for time. I love being crunched for time because there's so many good things going on in this place Sunday morning. There really is. And I love it. I never know exactly what God's going to do. Grace uh, is simply, uh, in the Greek, it's charis. My son will remember, and so will Eli, a girl by the name of Karis. She was from New Zealand, and she lived in... Dabs would know. I think she lived a summer in my basement. Where did she live? In the basement upstairs? You lived in the house. You lived in the basement, and she took over your room. That's it. She was a college girl from New Zealand, and we somehow stumbled across our paths. But Karis, that always tickles me, because Karis is the Greek word for grace. She was not always gracious. She was, uh, what you might call, pretty bold, but uh, <laughs> for lots of different reasons. Um, anyway, it is simply unmerited favor. Not the girl, but the grace we're talking about in Scripture. Grace that's extended to Paul. Paul, who has been the recipient of grace, who says, I stood there guarding the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen to death. I imprisoned these people. I tortured these people. I beat these people. I pulled these people out of their homes. I persecuted them everywhere. And yet God saved me. Woo! And so excited about it he is. And so unashamed of what it is he's done because God has washed it all away. God has washed all that sin away by the blood of Jesus, by the grace of God the Father through Jesus Christ, that Stephen says, I can admit in verse 19 and 20 that I did all these things and God has rescued me. Now, I don't know, maybe, probably there isn't anybody as bad as Paul in here this morning, although I wonder about Bar V. She seems like she's lived a pretty wild life to me. Because uh, she's had to tone it down pretty good. Uh, but she's still at, at, always on my case for one reason. She tell, he tells me where to plug in the tape recorder. And then she brings a tape recorder, a CD player that I don't know how to operate. And then she tells me that she set me up all the time. The woman is a wild person. Stand back, stand clear. But by the grace of God, she, God he has rescued her and all of us in here, and it's a wonderful thing that he has done so, because if he can rescue Paul, he can rescue anybody, he can rescue each and every one of them, and I trust indeed that he has. Now if he can rescue somebody like Lucy, who can drive a bulldozer down 408 at lickety split speed, clear the path of all the traffic in either direction, he can save you. If he can save, he can save any of you. And he has by his grace. This is the beauty of it. And it's something we don't deserve. And what happens as a result? Paul says, that's who I was. And this is who I am. I was a sinner. Saved by grace. I am something new. A new creature. I'm not that person anymore. I don't need to go back there anymore. I don't need to feel guilty anymore. I only regret I feel is that I didn't receive the grace of Jesus Christ sooner in my life or be apprehended fully by it. But God from that point on has apprehended me by His grace and now I am a new creature. That's what Paul is saying. Whoopee, I'm not that guy anymore. I'm a new guy. Transformation happens. There's no pleading or begging necessary to change your life when Christ, by His grace, apprehends you. Grace will transform you, just as did Paul. That's the beauty of it. In Acts chapter 9, you don't need to turn there. You can take my word for it because we've already been there. But uh, it says, when it's Paul on the road to uh, Damascus and God apprehends him, when God apprehends him and, and he goes to, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, what was the guy's name? House he went to. Help me out. After he was blinded, he went, it was Ananias? Yes? 
Well, I thought you knew the story. Well, yeah. <laughs> I was, help, surely, help me out here. Cute though, don't you? Don't say Habakkuk. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, sir. <Jim. laughs> <laughs> anyway, in that, in that chapter 9, excuse me? Did, oh, yes, but has Louise heard me? Louise? No. No, she doesn't like being put on the spot, Shirley. <laughs> You're good, Louise. Anyway, what happens here is what Paul has, this is unique and wonderful, and when you think about it, it happens to each one of us. Even though this is in the book of Acts, it's, it's what happens to each one of us. I know it has. If you've truly, truly received God's grace, something happens. When he says he saw in chapter 9, after the scales fell off his eyes, whatever that describes, whether it was physical or, or, or chemical or whatever, she says something like scales fell off my eyes and then what was he able to do? See. See. Who did he see but Jesus Christ? And that grace of transformation moved him from a persecutor of Christians to one who would ultimately become a martyr in the faith. Would be one of the chief proponents of Christianity to the Gentile world. A writer unparalleled in terms of his prolific qualities to the churches that he founded. Grace transforms. If there's not a transformation in your life, if you say you have received Jesus Christ, and there's no appreciable difference of what you were, your tastes, what you like, what you don't like, what you look at, what you don't look at, what things you are tempted at, what things you shouldn't be tempted at, places you go and you shouldn't go, all these things in a secret of lifestyle are transformational issues and they come as a result of grace, God's grace. And He gives it to you because He loves you. Amen. Go figure that. There are so many examples of God's grace in this church, quite frankly, it's hard to even list them all. It's hard to even keep track of them all. It really is. I mean, person to person. Grace is relational. You know, and I've appreciated from the day one that I came here a long time ago filling the pulpit that people didn't say, just say to me afterwards, don't come back, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Your stories are off target. You don't use the King James. You're a little wacky. And, uh, but you haven't, you, you, some of you have found more subtle ways to say that. But, um, <laughs> But I appreciated it. It's grace extended to me. And I have genuinely appreciated that. I really have. I have appreciated going in the grace extended to me when Eric first took me over to Edgar's place in Cast Isle. I was like, I never met Edgar before. I think I met him one Sunday in church before Eric took me over to visit him and cast out. It was still wintertime. Or no, it was in the fall, last fall. And I walked into his house and Edgar started telling me his story. And I was like, thank you, Edgar. That's a grace extended to me. That I know something about the testimony of God in his life. Do you understand that's a grace that we extend to each other? When Lucy shares with me these crazy things about driving bulldozers and backhoes and cars and, and using a chainsaw and driving and trying to knock down trees with a lawnmower and everything out there, and uh, I'm thanking Jesus that I get a chance to get in on her life with just a little bit. Just a little bit. The same with Mar I mean, all those of you who I've visited with a little bit. I love going to Shirley's house and not visiting with Shirley, but visiting with Rich. Oh, no, no, I'm not, Shirley. <laughs> I, I enjoy visiting with you. <laughs> that didn't come out right there, Shirley. Pick out me, I'll pick out you. <laughs> but I do love going to Shirley's because 
I remember that when her foot was up. Remember when your foot was up? I walked in. I walked up. My Rick said, now go right in. And she's in there. I opened the door. Sir, are you in there? She comes hopping out. I believe that was the time you had the thing on your foot. And, and I didn't know what it was, but she sat down in her chair and I kind of took a side long gaze at her foot and I could see it was looking pretty nasty. And it wasn't because it was dirty, because it was all purpley and yellowy and that kind of stuff. And so Shirley says, without even, without even blinking an eye, she said, Pastor, you want to see that? Just take that right off there for me. <laughs> so I reach on down and I, I say, I don't know if I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm not a person. But I did, I took that thing down, and she said, no, I want to wrap that part. And I'm like, no, I don't know if I want to do that. But she, we did it, and, and, and it wasn't quite as bad as I thought it was going to be. But you know, that's a grace that she extends to me. It might be a kind of a trust that says, well, I'm not going <laughs> to hurt her, and I'm not going to mock her. But it's just a certain kind of honesty that comes among people that like each other and trust each other. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's what happens here. That's what happens with Paul and his relationship with God. You see? That's the kind of relationship we should have with God. That we can expose to God our wounds, our injuries, the things that are black and blue and yellow, the kind of things that happen when we fall, when you have to find a way to get back to the house because you've fallen and you really... It's not a cliche, you can't get up. I mean, you have to find some kind of creative way to get back to the house. There are people that have been stuck in that moment. It's a kind of grace when God protects Diana from her fall a couple of weeks ago. She lets us in on that. That's the way it is with God. We can share those wounds and bruises and bumps and hurts and pains with God and with one another. But there's another aspect of this as well, that grace, when it's dispensed, produces something. Sin is defeated, but there's a purposeful sense to grace that is sort of connected, and that is grace needs to be shared. One of the things that ruins more churches, that destroys churches, that splits churches, is pride. Instead of grace. You've never heard of a church in a community that was known for its gracious and courteous demeanor that split. If a church divides, it divides because people have lost their sense of grace. It happened in my church in Geneseo. I saw it before my very eyes. People I knew for 25 years, all of a sudden, disliked me intensely, and they expressed it explicitly. And all the grace was gone out of the conversation. All the grace was gone. And when grace disappears, conflict emerges. And it's a tragic thing. And right now, as we're in the process, I pray, I trust God, of restoring the testimony of this church and this community. This church will be known for its grace and not its conflict. Amen. And I pray that each one of us will be known for our grace. The grace of Christ. And you can do it in lots of different ways. And we talked about it before when you go to the grocery store, save a lot. The grace of of, of, if, you, if you can do it, if you're paying attention to the people ahead of you and behind you, and people in your aisles, um, they're all about like us. Most of them go from paycheck to paycheck. Maybe they need a place where they can feel safe, where grace is extended to them. This might be that place. It's purposeful grace. In outline number 2F, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 10, Paul says, again, these are Paul's quotes, by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. This is a key verse, because grace just does not let you stay where you are. Grace 
has its effect on you. If it doesn't have an effect on you, then you don't have it. That sounds pretty blunt. It is blunt. If you say you're a Christian and you're without grace, I don't believe necessarily grace ever apprehended you, although I'm not one to judge, but this is what it says. Grace has its effect. I want to see the effect of grace. You want to demonstrate that effect of grace to others. Not for yourself, but to direct praise and glory to God. That's the whole point. God gets credit for it. God gets credit for it. It's pretty simple. But you know, isn't it oftentimes a whole lot easier to be graceless? <laughs> because you run into people in the world who aren't Christians, who are crazy people. Well, I've met some crazy Christians too. Some of them are seated right here. But, <laughs> but as I am looking at you, Shirley. And, uh, <laughs> but isn't it easier for us because we are basically by nature sinful creatures that we revert to the sinful nature and become graceless so easily? Have you ever noticed that so easily? Somebody rubs us the wrong way and right away the old man is in there. <laughs> that car cut me off. That guy, that young punk. I can say it because there aren't very many in here except for Caroline, and I wouldn't call her a punk, but uh, I would call her young. But, and you know, they cut us off, and, I, and my, my fans will say to me, what's wrong with you, Dave? Why are you so angry? That guy just blah, cut me off. And if I could, if I didn't have a brand new car, I'd ram in the bumper of that car, because my old sinful nature wants to do that. I want to get back at that guy. I just want wow, He can't do that. that he invaded my space. And then my wife rings me in. If it wasn't for my wife, I'd probably be in jail somewhere. Road rage. She says, you've gotten awful grumpy lately in your old age. I said, yeah, I guess so. But isn't it easier for, for, for us to revert to our old nature than it is to let the nature of grace take hold? Paul is saying, I used to be there. I'm no longer there. God is constantly doing the work of you. Now we can we can take two steps forward and one step back, I think, and that may not be good math for Christians, but as long as we're moving, we know we're going to fail. In fact, the choice the quote I have here at the bottom is important. Um, in number five, in the face of our failed attempts at loving Jesus, his God grace covers us by one of my more favorite pastors. <clears throat> Because we do, we fail at loving Christ so often, don't we? We just do. We neglect Him. We don't acknowledge Him. We don't pray to Him. We say, yes, I'm saved by grace. Isn't that wonderful? But yet we never develop the relationship. I say, and I have, a, I have when I first met Eric, I wasn't sure what to make of him. And I'm always picking on him. I'm sorry, you just pick on a little part sort of guy. And, and I was like, by grace, I have a relationship with my brother Eric or any, any other person in here. Because according to God's standard, we have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That makes us on an even playing field, spiritually in terms of being brothers and sisters in Christ. So I have some legal, uh, <coughs> heavenly legal relationship, but I didn't have a true human relationship, a real relationship, not a legal relationship. So he comes to my house and he hearkens, I told you this last week, he hearkens the sound of bullfrogs croaking in my pond and drool starts coming down the side of his mouth because he wants to go bullfrog hunting so he can cook up bullfrog legs for the next men for mission speeding and you can count on it. <laughs> That's a relationship. Now, I have a legal relationship and I have a human relationship of bonding between people. And that's true of all of us, isn't it? Legally, we are all related to Shirley. But we may not have as good a relationship with her as we could. I mean, I kind of picked on her a lot today and I'm sorry, I hope we didn't upset you or anything. Just send Richie to talk to me. He's got a problem with that. I'll take him. 
But it's a wonderful thing, it's truly a wonderful thing that we are united by grace through the blood of Jesus Christ, not only legally, but relationally. And, and you know, it takes time to develop gracious, relational friendships. And that's what we do here. Some of you have been doing it with each other for 50 years. Some of you, maybe even more. Some of us only for less than a year. But what I see is a great, gracious people united through the blood of Christ who are gracious one to another, who are trying to allow grace to pour out when the old sinful man says, get out of the way, Grace, I'm coming out, baby. <laughs> and then we have regret. We have confession to do. A wonderful thing to be found in the grace of God. And if it can save Paul, if it can deliver him in a life of service and love to uh, our Savior Jesus Christ, we should be able to do the same. I hope you can. I hope you're in the pilgrimage with me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace toward us. It is a wonderful thing to be found in Jesus Christ, and it's a wonderful thing to be loved by you. It's a wonderful thing that you extend this unmerited love, this unmerited favor to us, just because, just because you can. And because you can, you did, and because you did, you have us as your kids, your children, your joint heirs. God, I just can't even understand why. Imagine how come, but you do. How wonderful is that? Each one of us bound to you, Jesus, in the mystery of grace. It is a mystery, this grace, that comes only from the model of God the Father's heart, that you would extend your Son to endure the cross, that we might be saved by grace and grace alone. God bless all of us in this congregation and Christians everywhere, that we might be more fully apprehended by the notion of what it means to live a gracious life in grace, by grace, through grace, for grace, for the glory of God our Father. Thank you for this time, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to sing the last thing, which is, imagine that, amazing grace, 236 if you want, if you would stand If you're not familiar with the story behind Amazing Grace, you should know that uh, John Newton came to Christ as a younger man. He was involved in the slave trade. You might not have known that. When he was involved in the slave trade, he only made three voyages of uh, packing slaves and selling them. The three was enough. When he wrote the song, he wrote it as a poem, and it wasn't until many years later, uh, almost 40 years later, that it was a tune was applied. And when it was, it was applied in London, in England, at that time, where William Wilberforce led the British government in repealing all slave trading and all slave traffic in the United Kingdom. And so John Newton was one of those prime movers. It was his act of grace along with many others that prompted the government of Britain to do away with the slave trade, to make it illegal and punishable as a criminal offense. So let me read this, and it was written from a white man's perspective, but oftentimes you hear it sung by African Americans because they were the ones who were the recipients of all the slave trade, basically. Um, so we often hear, if, as we sing it today, let's uh, remember the grace that Christ extended to us. Can we please?
extended to us and the grace we have extended one to the other and we have received. Help us to continue to be your gracious, loving people wherever we go. And we pray especially this morning, be with our dear sister Alice, encourage her spirit, which I'm sure must be a little down. She hates missing church. Give her encouragement, we pray. We say, send us on our way with your blessing, if you please, Father, in Jesus' name. 